Consider the same reaction as that given in example 13.9 in Smith, Van Ness and Abbott. Using the same molar composition at time zero, instead of considering a steady flow reactor, we want the reaction to take place in a batch reactor where the volume of the vessel stays constant. Still adiabatic. Let us consider a process where the initial temperature in the reactor is 298 Kelvin and its pressure is 500 kilopascals. Before you continue, what do you expect to happen to the pressure in the reactor as the reaction proceeds? You are asked to calculate the pressure, temperature and composition in this reactor vessel once equilibrium has been achieved at the end of the process. We therefore have 1, 2 and the 4 gas mole fractions as unknowns. Mole fractions we are ever going to express in terms of our reaction coordinate, which means that we have 3 unknowns and we therefore need 3 equations to solve the system. From tables we can find the thermodynamic parameters for this reaction. In our tables the standard state was given at 298 Kelvin. For our first equation, we are going to do an energy balance for this system. It's a closed system, not in motion, with no work interactions. The volume stays constant, so there is also no squash work, and we were told that it is adiabatic. The energy balance implies that the change in internal energy due to the reaction at a specific temperature, plus the change in internal energy of the mixture due to a change in temperature must balance each other out. Since we are going to consider all our gases to be ideal gases, the change in internal energy due to a change in pressure can be neglected. We will calculate the change in internal energy due to the reaction at a temperature where we have information available for this variable. Since we have the reaction enthalpy available at 298, we are limited in calculating the change in internal energy of the reaction also at that temperature. This term normally causes most of the confusion when we calculate the change in heat of reaction standard state at 298 Kelvin. If we apply the ideal gas law, we can see that it will only change due to the change in the number of moles. Do not be tempted to write this change in the number of moles in terms of the equilibrium epsilon. This refers to the change in the number of moles per mole of reaction. It is therefore simply equal to the sum of the stoichiometric numbers in your reaction equation, which in our case is minus 0.5 mole per mole reaction. Substitution of values in this equation will now allow us to calculate the change in internal energy due to the reaction at 298 in units of joules per mole reaction. In our energy balance, we want the energy terms to be in joules. This implies that we have to multiply our internal energy of reaction, which has got units of joules per mole reaction, with the reaction coordinate, with units of mole reaction. The part in the energy balance which considers the change in temperature of the reacting mixture, because its idle gases can be calculated as NCVDT, summed over all the components, with the beginning temperature 298 Kelvin and the temperature at the end the unknown value that we need to calculate. Since the number of moles of each of the components will change because of the presence of the chemical reaction, the order in which we are going to perform the calculation of these two components in the energy balance is important to consider. Since we only have the reaction internal energy available at 298 Kelvin, we will first react our mixture in order to form our products that is going to be present at the end and then we are going to heat up our resultant product mixture that is now present in the reactor to that unknown final temperature. 
So we must heat up all the gases in the mixture when equilibrium has been achieved to that final temperature. The number of moles of each of the components is now a function of our equilibrium reaction coordinate. In our energy balance we now have two unknowns, the reaction coordinate, the final temperature, and remember that the number of moles at equilibrium for each of the components are also a function of the reaction coordinate. Never overlook the obvious when you are setting up your equations. We can calculate the reaction volume at the beginning of the process, which must, must remain constant. The number of moles at the end we can express as a function of epsilon. And we have our second equation containing all three our unknown parameters. Our third equation comes from our equilibrium relationships. We can calculate our equilibrium constant at 298 Kelvin from the thermodynamic parameters of our reaction. We can now use Van Dorff's equation to calculate our equilibrium constant at the final temperature in our reaction vessel, which is our unknown variable, with that K value at 298 Kelvin. We are now actually introducing one additional unknown into our set of variables, which means that we will need an additional equation. The fact that our fugacity ratio equation at equilibrium must be equal to that equilibrium constant at our final temperature gives us that extra equation that we need. By substituting the mole fractions in terms of the reaction coordinate from our stoichiometric table, we can get our pressure epsilon relationship for equilibrium constant at final reaction temperature. In example 13.9 in Smith, Van Ness and Abbott with a steady state problem, this term is not present in their expression for K because the reaction takes place at a constant pressure of 1 atmosphere. After substitution of K in terms of pressure and epsilon into our Van Dorff equation, we have our third and final equation. This problem can easily be solved by using a solver function like F solve in Python. Just remember the restrictions on the range for epsilon values since multiple solutions of epsilon is possible. However, if we have to do it with our handout calculators, a fixed point iteration loop will also work well. Our energy balance results in a linear relationship between two of our unknown variables. So this is where we will start by guessing a value for our temperature at the end. Since our reaction is exothermic, we will know to guess an end value for temperature that is higher than our initial temperature value. Using our guess value for temperature, we can now calculate a corresponding value for epsilon. In equation 2, we can substitute for our temperature and epsilon values that we got from our energy balance in order to solve pressure end in our system. Using our first trial values for epsilon and pressure, we can now calculate the equilibrium constant that we are supposed to have in our reactor. This first trial value for the equilibrium constant can now be used in the Van Dorff equation to calculate our new value for temperature. If this new value is the same as the value that we guessed, we are very lucky, and the variables that we calculated from all our equations will be the final answers. It is more likely that you will not have um, psychic abilities and you will have to redo the loop. With the new temperature, we can recalculate epsilon using the energy balance, recalculate pressure from our constant volume condition, recalculate K from the fugacity relationships at the pressure and epsilon, the new values, and now from the Van Dorff equation, we can calculate a new value for temperature. Of course, we can exit the loop 
once the new value that we get from our Van Dorf equation is the same as the one that we used at the start of the loop.